But I did entitle the message, Why You Must Watch. And the short answer, and I could sit down right after that, the short answer is to be ready when Christ returns. That's the short answer. But the real question is, what must we watch? What must we, we watch? Now I have taken the time and have gone through the scriptures, and I must have at least 25 or so scriptures here going into that very issue, and I'm not going to read them all to you. In fact, I intend to not read that many, but I will quote a few excerpts from the scriptures, perhaps not even telling you where they are, but you should be able to recognize most of them. For instance, there's one passage which says, blessed is he who watches. Now, I'll give you a hint, that is actually in the book of Revelation. And the context is watching events leading to Armageddon. So it gives you already a clue as to what to watch. We are talking about world events in the light of biblical prophecy. A very famous passage, and I want to quote this to you, but just give you the scripture without turning there, is Mark 13, beginning in verse 28. Because here Christ gives the parable from the fig tree. And then he talks about the fact that even though you do not know the time of Christ's return, you don't know the day, the hour, frankly, you don't know the year either, but he says there are signs. There are certain things which will happen in the world. And he says, and when you see these things happening, know that it is near at the doors. He goes on to say, take heed, watch and pray. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. So Christ wasn't just talking about the disciples at his time. He was talking about all of us. And again, the context of this passage clearly is the return of Jesus Christ. So we also, of course, must know our spirit, uh, must watch rather our spiritual condition. That's very important. But you see, in watching world events, which should show us, specifically us living in the end times, that the time is near, that he is at the door, as Mark said, that should motivate us. It should motivate us to get quite serious about our calling. Because you see, Christ is standing at the door knocking. And we are living today in the Love Seen era. And Christ is outside knocking. And he wants us to open the doors to let him in. The warning is clear and unmistakably clear. See, as God's church, we have the duty to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom of God in all the world as a witness to all the nations. That's our commission. That's our duty. That's our responsibility today. Now, of course, the main tasks for that rest with the ministry. But the members are to support this mission wholeheartedly. And so the entire church is supposed to be functioning as a watchman. As part of the watchman, all need to watch themselves, need to watch their spiritual conditions individually, but they also need to watch what is going on in the world because it will show them that the return of Christ is near if they know what to watch for. How can you support the church's commission being a watchman if you're not watching? You are find yourself outside what the responsibility of the church is. You see, in the book of Micah, in chapter 7, and in verse 4, and again, you can look at this later, it talks about that the day of your watchman and the punishment has come. See, the watchman is supposed to prepare the people for what is going to happen. The context in this passage is a great tribulation for Israel. And so, when the day of the watchman has come, it means that what the watchman has proclaimed is going to happen. Are we today proclaiming 
that the great tribulation for the house of Israel and the house of Judah is coming soon? You bet. Every week, when you read carefully our updates, you should be able to see that. When you listen to our Standing Watch programs, when you read our booklets, when you listen to our sermons. In Jeremiah, in chapter 6, you read, I set watchmen over you, saying, listen to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not listen. The context again is the warning given in all the world, if you read the entire passage in Jeremiah 6, but especially towards the houses of Israel and Judah. You see, we have said it so many times, the watchman, and we are today that kind of a watchman, has a duty to warn the people of impending war. Whether the people believe it or not, we know that war is coming. We know that the Great Tribulation is going to start soon. Now, I'm not saying in what year, I'm not giving any dates, but we know it has to start soon. And that means the United States of America and Great Britain will be defeated in a nuclear war. They will end up in slavery, those who will survive, because most people will not survive. Most cities will be destroyed, wiped out from this planet. Think of the big, huge cities. San Francisco, New York, Washington, you may name them. They will be gone. That is the clear message of the Bible. That is what God wants the people to know so that at least some are willing to repent. At least some are willing to change their ways of life to survive what is going to happen. The watchman has a duty to warn. If the watchman doesn't do it, the blood of the people will be on his head. But don't think, oh, it's just the minister's task. No, we all are involved. We all are supposed to be involved. You see, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul is telling us to watch. What is the context? When you read that passage, it says, beware of the times and seasons. Realize the conditions leading to the day of the Lord. And he says, most people will be surprised when it strikes. Most people will not expect that sudden destruction which is going to come upon them. It will come like a thief in the night, it says. But we have not to be, we mustn't be, as those who will be caught unawares. And so this is kind of the introduction to what I want to talk about today because what I'd like to do now is to go through the current events section of the update. And in doing that, I will show you that the articles we publish, and we do it on a weekly basis, have everything to do with news important in the light of biblical prophecy. You see, the first article, or the series of articles, have to do with the Donald Trump phenomenon. Now, I'm not going to talk about this now, because I've given a standing watch program on this very issue. But you see, most people probably are blind to what's really going to happen here. They can't put their finger on it. And some who see there is more involved than just quote unquote time and chance, think that maybe with a guy like him, if he ever were to become a leading personality, things might perhaps slow down. And maybe we have more time with a strong leader. And my feeling is just the opposite will be true. And so again, the standing watch goes into that. Now, we say that other news in this issue address astonishing revelations in Hillary Clinton's emails regarding David Cameron and a possible Brexit, the fight over the Iran deal, the situation in Greece, Germany's gain of 100 billion euros from the Greece crisis, ongoing violation, violations, or violence I should say, and surrounding Turkey, 
growing religious Zionism in Israel, the wait for a red heifer. I'll talk about that in a moment. The call of British and German governments for a crackdown on migrants. The fear that Putin is preparing for war against Germany. China's devaluation. The disaster of Durango. And further nonsense regarding gender equality and human marriages with machines, as well as frightening developments regarding robot armies. Now, does any of this ring a bell? Every single topic should, if you understand biblical prophecy. I want to give you a few examples. Again, I'm skipping the quote unquote, quote unquote many articles on the Trump phenomenon. But here is the one on Clinton's email messages. And the Daily Mail wrote on August 3 that an email sent in October 2009 barely six months before Mr. Cameron became Prime Minister, suggests Mr. Cameron might be unable to stop his party from taking Britain out of the European Union. Again, something we have been saying for years. Britain will have to leave the European Union for the simple reason because the European Union, continental Europe, will fight in war against them in the not too distant future. So here, the certain people in the American government already saw that, that that was in all likelihood going to occur. Not that there's going to be a war, but that they are going to leave Great Britain. Of course, we talk about the Greek deal, and if you watch the news, you know that on Friday evening or late in the night, the ministers, finance ministers of Europe struck a deal with Greece, and so for the time being, Greece is going to stay in the Eurozone, it still will have to be approved by the parliaments, but they all kind of feel like it's going to be. And again, as I said from the outset, with Greece, it's kind of a question mark. They could stay in, they don't have to be. So it's something to watch, but it is also showing very clearly how the European Union and the Eurozone is desperate in trying to keep it together. Humanly speaking, it doesn't make that much sense, actually. But we know that we are not dealing here with just human endeavors. We, are knowing, we, we know that something is happening here, again, based on what God wants to happen, based on biblical prophecy. You know that out of the Eurozone, ten nations, or groups of nations, will arise, and they will give their power to the beast, and the beast will fight against America and Great Britain. And that is what's going to happen. And that is why these important news are of tremendous consequence. Now, another one is waiting for the red heifer. Now, we have a rather lengthy article here, published by the Times of Israel, and then we are referring to a Q&A, pointing out that the idea that a red heifer must appear in order to bring about the return of Jesus Christ is not based on the Bible. There's nothing in the Bible suggesting that, but it is something specifically the Jews are expecting. And this morning I found this article by GTA, and I'd like to read that to you. It's been nearly two millennia since the second temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, bringing to an end the priestly period of Jewish history and commencing the diaspora. A third temple has been prophesied, and in preparation for the Messiah, a non-profit Jewish group, the Temple Institute, wants to build it. And then they're talking about producing this perfect red heifer. And so, of course, our article also points that out how they're trying to do it. But what I found interesting are some following comments here. The project is controversial. The site of the ancient temples, and thus a prescribed site for the new one, is on Jerusalem's Temple Mount, where sites holy to Muslims the Dome of the Rock and the al aqsa Mosque have stood for 13 centuries. The Temple Institute has admitted that the mosques must be cleared for the building of the temple to begin. And then it says that Haaretz reported in 2013 that a majority of religious and non-religious Jews want the third temple to be built. It goes on to say that if so, they will be ritually sacrificed those red heifers and burned at age two 
allowing newly purified priests to ascend the Temple Mount, and then the holy wars will begin. Now, I found that an interesting article in light of what we know, because we know a third temple is going to be built. The Bible makes this very clear. For instance, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4 talks about the false prophet, the man of sin, who is going to be sitting in the temple of God, proclaiming to be God. Now, that's not talking about the church. It's talking about a real temple in Jerusalem. And he will be in that temple, perhaps in the Holy of Holies, proclaiming to be God. By the way, that reminds me. Did you know what feast is being celebrated today in the Catholic Church, August 15? It is the third holiest feast of the Catholic Church. It's called the Assumption of Blessed Mary. And so I was reading up a little bit on that, and that's what they are teaching. When she died, she immediately was taken bodily, bodily to heaven, where she now rules as the queen of heaven. Does this ring any bells? Think in terms of the false prophet proclaiming that he will be God, sitting in the temple of God. Another article we have in here is entitled, What is Putin up to? Built online reported on August 11 that during the Russian military exercise, which is being conducted in Kaliningrad, which is only 500 kilometers from Berlin, where we are going to have our feast this year, bombs and transporters are carrying the designation to Berlin and for Stalin. The paper stated that both labels, to Berlin and for Stalin, were war cries used by the Russians in their fight against Nazi Germany. Observers do not feel that those labels were only attached because of nostalgia, but that they show dangerous tendencies of Putin and the Russian military. And the Telegraph added on August 12 that Russia and NATO are actively preparing for war with one another amid the greatest build-up of military tension in Europe since the end of World War or the Cold War. Now, why is that important? Because you have prophecies in the book of Daniel, chapter 11, and also in the book of Revelation, chapter 9, that kings from the East, which would include, of course, Russia, will attack, or rather will fight with, Europe. Europe will attack first, and then the kings of the East will retaliate. That's going to happen in the future. We know this. And here we see a military buildup. We see the relationship between Russia and especially continental Europe deteriorating by the day, you might say. Again, is this of any importance? Is it important when we write about, are there going to be marriages with robots? Now that sounds, sounds kind of strange to begin with, but it's leading up to something. Because the next article talks about the rise of brain-controlled robot armies. And it says in the Daily Mail that the future of warfare could see robot armies controlled using just the commander's mind. And of course, the fear is, as this article points out, that they're going to be used for warfare. Now, we find an interesting prophecy in Revelation chapter 9 and verse 16, talking about an army of horsemen, describing the kings of the East, saying this will include 200 million, 200 million. The King James Bible translates 200 million horsemen. But the interesting thing is the word men is not in the Greek. It only says it's a cavalry force of 200 million blank. Now I've suggested before that perhaps, underlined, we're not necessarily talking about just people. Because I took the time to look at the population. Now, first of all, it couldn't be just Russia. Even when you look at the Russian population today, it has only 146 million. That's the entire population of Russia. So you couldn't make 200 million out of that. So you know that the kings of the East will have to include Russia and China and India and Pakistan and maybe Indonesia and Japan and other places. 
Now, if you look just at the population, yes, you would get way over 200 million, of course. But if you look at the military, and even though it's kind of difficult to get those figures from the internet, you wouldn't get anywhere near 200 million. So now, is it possible? Is it possible that robots will be used in the future? They're already working very, very hard to get that done. It's just a question we got to ask ourselves. I mean, you look at commentaries, they all feel it's not really talking about people. Most of them feel it's talking about demons. That's just a figurative way of describing things. I'm not to show that that is correct. I think it's talking about something real, but it doesn't have to be people. But in any event, we know 200 million, that's a huge, huge army. They will fight against Europe in the near future. All right, that's all actually I want to say about the news events, but it goes a little bit further because our Q&A goes into are God's ministers important for healing? Now one scripture I didn't quote when it talks about watching is the fact that Paul is warning all of us as he has warned the church of Ephesus at his time to watch careful in Acts chapter 20, watch for what? The context is watch for the arrival of false teachers and false ministers in the church of God. The context is the fact that the Bible prophesies a falling away from the truth of God. It's going to come. See, the context is when the man of sin arrives, saying that he is going to be in the temple of God, claiming to be God, at the same time this falling away, approximately at the same time this falling away from the truth is still going to take place. It's going to be connected. It's a falling away from the truth. It's not a falling away from something organizations never had. See, some claim that the Catholic Church getting bigger. See, they never had the truth. So it's not talking about falling away from the truth. It's talking about God's church. It's talking about, especially the Laodicean era, where many, many people are sound asleep. They think they have everything and they have nothing. They don't know how lukewarm they really are. And Paul says, watch for false ministers. And brings this up because this Q&A has prompted a response from a minister. And let me first of all read to you what we said in this Q&A. Because it's talking about, do we need God's ministers for healing? And the answer is absolutely yes. Because the Bible does make this very clear. He said, God's ministers today lay their hands on the sick person's head, then they anoint him or her with oil, setting him or her apart to receive God's power of healing. Christ said in Mark 16, 18, that sick people will recover when his ministers, God's ministers, lay their hands on the sick. When they send a cloth, they place their hands on the anointed cloth while praying to God for healing for the sick person. So one minister from another organization took great umbrage with this, writing us that this is all wrong because you don't have to be a minister to lay your hands on people to heal them, and that would apply to both men and women. Now that is blasphemous. I mean, that is absolutely horrendous. But I'm bringing this up to show you the confusion which is already going on in many corners in God's church. And when I say God's church, I mean in a broader sense. So yes, we have to watch. We have to watch those who may come to us. And Paul even warns that even within the church, people will rise preaching doctrines of demons and thereby deceiving the many. And Christ actually said, you know, I've told you, there will be many false prophets, and they will deceive the many. And he says, and where it is possible, it says if possible in the King James, he would even, or they would even deceive the very elect. The word if possible really means wherever it is possible. It doesn't say that it's not possible for the very elect to be deceived. We all got to be extremely careful. We also say but at the end of this Q&A, that faith in God's healing is absolutely necessary. But sometimes God may not intervene immediately because he wants to test our patience. Even after having received anointing, it is necessary while we might not be healed immediately, while we might not be healed immediately, to continue praying to God day and night for his merciful intervention. 
Look at Luke 8, verse 7. It would be ill-advised to think that we do not need God's ministry in order to be healed. The Bible teaches the opposite, and we must obey God in all things. And those who feel that they can do it without the way God put it, they are, of course, without any promise, none whatsoever, that they could be healed. Now, God, in his great mercy, might overlook ignorance. I'm not saying that. But I am saying, once you know the truth, you better abide by it. Now, that goes back to some more comments I want to make regarding update 701, which you all have received. The editorial was written by Rob Harris, A Great Place to Be. And I just want to hit two statements he made. He says, simply desiring to follow after Christ is not enough to keep us retaining this knowledge. Notice, he's talking about we have received knowledge, but simply desiring to follow Christ or, you know, saying, oh, yeah, I want to follow Christ. He says, that's not enough. Many in this world call upon the name of Christ, but few are doing what it takes to be heard by him. And then later on, he says, while many would be drawn to the word of God, some would not have their minds truly committed. Some would fall away because of temptation, and others would be unwilling to give up worldly pursuits. And he gives several scriptures here making that point. So as we have said time and again, it's not good enough to just say, Lord, Lord, because Christ says, you know, why you call me Lord and don't do the things which I tell you? And let's say even asking the ministry for anointing, whether it's personally or via anointed clause when you are sick, belongs to the commandments God has given you. And some are very reluctant to do it for whatever reason. It's foolish. Take advantage of what God is offering. But do take advantage. Now the forum was written by Phyllis Burke, Count on Me, and she says she relates an interesting experience with her daughter, when, of course, they were all younger, much younger, and she says, I noticed that her happiness, her daughter's happiness, was, all, was directly connected with me picking her up at the appointed time, you know, after school, and her unhappiness was connected with the days that I stayed later at work. And in her mind, she couldn't rely on me. She couldn't count on me. So she points out how important it is that when you say something, you do it. When you say, oh, I'm going to see you tomorrow at 5 o'clock, you're going to be there at 5 o'clock. Not at 7 o'clock or not at all. It's interesting. Some people, you just know. They tell you, oh, I'm going to see you tomorrow. They're not going to see you tomorrow. You just know it. Because their reputation is such they cannot be relied upon. And, of course, that is not a Christian trait. So very, very good forum, very well done. In the work, we are making the announcement that our newest booklet is going to be reviewed. It's titled, at least that's the proposed title, Do You Know the Jesus of the Bible? And it goes mainly into the way Jesus lived when he was here on earth as a human being. Because we have already a booklet on the mystery of Jesus Christ. This one would be a follow-up booklet on aspects we have not covered mainly in this other booklet. A new member letter has been sent out. It was written by Mr. Eric Rank, and in this letter he addresses the powerful influence of pride and compromise and warns that Christians must constantly evaluate, evaluate and be on guard against the attitudes which are characterized in the message to Laodicea, something we just talked about also in the sermonette. A sermon has been recorded and is being put together, which is going to be played at the feast. It's titled, Does God Travel? And of course, this sermon goes into many things. Even though the title is, Does God Travel? It also goes into who and what God actually is. And what the orthodox Christianity concept is, which is totally, and I mean totally, against what the Bible says, in case you didn't know this. How Orthodox Christianity, whether it's a Catholic Church, whether it's a Protestant Church, whether it's a Greek Orthodox Church, whether it's most of the Protestant churches, however they teach and, ex and explain and understand God, it's not at all, not at all, in accordance with what the Bible says. 
And since we, most of us, came out of this environment, we have to be very careful that we don't fall back into it because it can be easily done. That's why I've always personally recommended against watching movies where Jesus is portrayed. I just don't like that because you're getting a wrong image. When you see Jesus movies and you see Jesus being portrayed, you know he didn't look like that. But, you know, you still get this image, and I just don't like it anyway. That's just my own personal opinion. We have a standing watch out there. It's a Trump phenomenon, how to explain it. And this is a short summary here. No matter what Donald Trump is saying or doing, he has so far emerged as the uncontested winner in just about every battle or controversy. And his popularity is rising. Why is this so? How can the Trump phenomenon be explained? Could it be that God has a hand in it and that events are taking place to fulfill biblical prophecy for the end time. It's important you know the truth, but some people look at that and come to wrong conclusions, as I mentioned.